Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist and the Voice of Compliance, and I'd like to welcome you to a special five-part podcast series on the current state of compliance, issues, and challenges, where I visit with Terry Orr, the Managing Director at Kroll, a division of Duff & Phelps. Kroll is the sponsor of this podcast series. In this podcast series, we visit with Terry about his professional background, the current state of compliance through the lens of recent FCPA enforcement actions, the evaluation of corporate compliance programs 2019 guidance. We consider some of the specific issues for compliance in the private equity arena and the increased importance of compliance in the ever-changing healthcare space. First, a word about our sponsor, Kroll and Duff & Phelps. Kroll is a Leading provider of risk solutions for more than 45 years, Kroll has helped clients make confident risk management decisions about people, assets, operations, and security through a wide range of investigations, cybersecurity, due diligence, and compliance, physical and operational security, and data and information management services. For more information on Kroll, visit Kroll's website, www.kroll.com. Duff & Phelps, the parent of Kroll is the global advisor that protects, restores, and maximizes value for clients in the areas of valuation, corporate finance, investigations, disputes, cybersecurity compliance, regulatory matters, and other government-related issues. Duff & Phelps works with clients across diverse sectors, mitigating risk to assets, operations, and people. With Kroll, a division of Duff & Phelps since 2004, the firm has nearly 3,500 professionals in 28 countries around the world. For more information on Duff & Phelps, visit their website, www.duffandphelps.com. In this first episode, I visit with Terry Orr on how he came to focus on the compliance space and where he sees compliance headed down the road. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, and you're in for a real treat this week because I have with me Terry Orr, and Terry and I are going to visit about uh, several uh, significant topics around not only ethics and compliance, but also forensic auditing, internal controls, and a wide variety of other issues that the compliance practitioner needs to consider. Uh, In this first episode, we are going to take a look at Terry's background. So, Terry, with that incredibly long-winded introduction, first of all, welcome, and thank you for taking the time to visit with me. Well, thanks, Tom. I appreciate being with you. So, Terry, um, you have perhaps an interesting background. I think that's a fair statement to say. Uh, but um, uh, And we both live in the great state of Texas, uh, but you didn't start here. So uh, could you tell us a little bit about your background, kind of what uh, led you up to a auditor and a forensic accountant? Sure. Um, well, I grew up, as you indicated, I did not grow up in Texas. I grew up in Wyoming. Uh, it's very similar um, in many ways to Texas. But I grew up in a community outside of Cody, Wyoming, which was the home of Buffalo Bill Cody. And um, maybe many of your listeners have been through that part of the country and Yellowstone National Park. But I was raised on a farm ranching operation with lots of hard work at an early age. Uh, I grew up in a very small community, uh, Emblem, Wyoming. Uh, It was a German settlement. Um, The population believe it or not, was five, which is our family. Uh, People traveling through, would you'd see them stop the car, unload all the kids, and take a picture of their family in front of the sign, uh, indicating that they um, outpopulated uh, the town. Um, I went to a two-room schoolhouse, grades uh, one through eight. Um, Grades one through four were taught by Mrs. Carlson, and grades five through eight. Uh, by Mr. Carlson. I went to a high school of about 100 uh, students, uh, 22 in my graduating class. Um, Small, you know, small community. Uh, But my father always emphasized the importance of gaining uh, education and getting away from the farming ranching operations. So I went to college. I went to uh, uh, Brigham Young University, graduated uh, with a degree in accounting and a near uh, master's degree in tax, and uh, started my public accounting uh, career. Um, I spent 27 years in public accounting as an auditor and audit partner, and then left public accounting and spent the last 13 years of my career as a forensic accountant, consultant, and expert witness. 
So, Terry, I'm always interested and intrigued by the why question, but specifically uh, why you do what you do. So uh, why is it you are now uh, or have been rather an auditor, a forensic accountant uh, going forward? Well, I think it relates somewhat to my background. Um, the, um, you know, growing up in a small community and, and wanting to expand that and explore and um, uh, address the questions of the world. So my why is I like to educate and help people and businesses meaningfully address challenges they're facing through the asking of insightful questions and the development of alternative solutions. Additionally, I, I like the process of finding a solution or solving a puzzle. I always have. You have been involved in some interesting cases from in your uh, professional uh, history, and I was wondering if you might just be able to highlight uh, for us some of the interesting cases you've been involved in from your perspective and why you found them so interesting. Well, I can't uh, name any company names, but there are some that come to mind. Uh, one in particular um, that really jumps to the forefront of my thoughts on this is um, one that I was uh, called into. Um, the auditors had uh, identified a $23 million shortfall in the company's balance sheet. Um, the amount was material to the financial statements. This was a public company. Uh, the company investigated the missing assets to no avail and finally brought in uh, outside assistance, brought us in to, to help uh, find out what happened to these, to these missing assets. Um, we determined pretty early on that no funds had been stolen from the company. And over time, we determined that the issue resided in the marketing department. The head of the marketing department was a 65-year-old uh, grandmother type of uh, person. She'd been with the company most of her working career. She was the sweetest, nicest lady. And uh, my team was really split on whether she could be involved in anything nefarious. Uh, many just discounted that, you know, she's such a nice lady and seemed so uh, genuine that she couldn't be involved in any, any, any kind of wrongdoing. Um, I was working one night trying to figure this out, solve this puzzle. And I started looking at budget overruns in the marketing department uh, compared to their actual spend. And I started adding that up over a series of years and identified that over this time period that the amount added up to the lost $23 million. Um, the sweet marketing director had taken upon herself to spend additional marketing dollars to support the business above the budget uh, marketing amounts, budgeted marketing amounts, and hid the difference in various prepaid accounts. And then those accounts uh, were later written off and the uh, lost funds were discovered. The company had gone through budget cuts and she'd felt that the budget cuts um, negatively would have a negative impact on the financial health of the company. And Rather than jeopardize the financial health of the company, she continued to spend the dollars she felt were necessary to um, support the company. She never. The interesting deal is she never took a dime for herself, uh, but her actions resulted in the company needing to restate financial statements and revise their internal control structure besides having to address um, many uh, shareholder concerns. Um, I think it's just, you know, it's fascinating for me as I investigate different issues at companies. But this one jumps out that, um, you know, no monies were taken. Uh, she attempted to do what she thought was the right thing, um, resulting in, you know, um, real uh, catastrophe for the company. But uh, – it's just, it just was a very interesting case and one that was uh, somewhat hard to solve because uh, no monies were taken. So with um, – I find it really interesting, Terry, in that case, really just picking up on your last point, that no monies were taken, yet it was really catastrophic for the company in terms of uh, having to restate uh, – make a financial restatement, 
uh, probably uh, related civil litigation involving shareholders and perhaps others, and then what it did uh, internally to the morale uh, and culture of the company. Uh, you're absolutely correct. It it had devastating effect on the company um, and others in the company uh, that you know for a while were. Um, maybe under the sp- suspicion of having been involved in some nefarious activities. Terry, there's uh, been, a f- I thought, s- some significant developments in the FCPA this year and going back a few months, both in terms of the enforcement actions and, of course, the release of the uh, Evaluation of Corporate Compliance Program's 2019 guidance I was wondering if you might be able to give our audience uh, just a tease of some of the things that you hope to uh, talk about in this podcast series around uh, the FCPA and the Department of Justice. Sure. Happy to do so. I think that uh, through some of the FCPA, the, you know, the resolution of some of the investigations that the DOJ did last year, we're able to see uh, some of their thoughts, uh, the DOJ's thoughts, um, I think those investigations resulted in some significant findings, and those findings result now in what should be applied as best practices, so we'll cover some of those. And then, as you indicated, the DOJ's uh, recent guidance on corporate compliance emphasizes the importance of kind of the topics we've been talking about uh, of having strong a strong compliance program uh, that meets best practices that addresses uh, the findings and new issues that uh, surface every year as a result of investigations and then I think some additional upcoming topics that I'd like to talk about are some of the changes in healthcare. The recently enacted uh, recovery kickback prohibition. We've seen some of those, some of that uh, manifested uh, in in activities in our market, and I think we'll see more in that area. So um, I'd like to talk more about that as well. Well, Terry, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time for this episode, but I hope the audience will join us again tomorrow when we take up some of these new developments in the FCPA. Terry, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I hope you will join us again tomorrow for our next episode. Once again, if you have any questions on Kroll, you can check out their website, www.kroll.com. This special five-part podcast presentation on the current state of compliance issues and challenges it is sponsored by Kroll. It's a special presentation of the Compliance Podcast Network, and it's also available through the C-Suite Radio. Thank you for listening. I look forward to visiting with you tomorrow.